Kathleen. It's nice to have an audience to play to. The great chairs are a little boring. Okay. Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Uh, before we start with Jared, remember, stop drinking early enough that you will be able to take part in tonight's activities. They will not let you into the Zomba or onto the uh, segways if you are drunk. I don't know if they'll let you herd geese. Two drinks. Um, the second thing is, is remember that um, we will we'll be having our own um, Belgian team sponsors uh, working in the bar later tonight to watch the game. Um, the one man Belgium versus all of the English here, so we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, starting with the talk. How many of you have seen the mirror that says there is a ghost? Good. We couldn't actually bring the ghost of Stephen Covelli here to present tonight, so instead we've got Jared giving us the seven habits. And first, first uh, Ms. So, so when, I, when I set out to do this talk, I, I kind of cheated a little bit. And I was talking with Dan when he was trying to organize the conference, and ho hopefully, oh, there he is. And, and, and I kind of cheated the system, and I'm going to admit it here publicly. Because when, when Dan started talking about the conference and put out the call for papers, the first thing I did was say, hey, Dan, do you want me to give a technical talk? Do you want me to give a less technical talk? Do you, you know, what, what type of talk is underrepresented in your conference? And that's my secret. If you ever want to speak at a conference, contact the organizers, ask them what they want. They're usually pretty good about telling you what they want and then picking you to come give that, that type of presentation. So I cheated. And Dan asked me to give a non-technical presentation, which made things a little harder for me. And, uh, and so that's what I've tried to do today. Um, I've tried to take some things that I've learned in, in, in my crazy career and some things that I've learned from other people along the way and kind of, kind of incorporate that, and, and playing a little bit off the seven habits from Stephen Covey. We'll talk about that in a minute. But before I do that, I need some audience participation. This is not a death by PowerPoint presentation by any stretch of the imagination. So first of all, we're going to do some exercises. So I want everybody to nod their head up and down like this. OK, that's how, that's how you let me know that I'm making sense. OK, everybody shake your head side to side like this. Okay, if you do that during my talk, I'm going to think you're saying, oh, that doesn't make sense, and I'm going to repeat myself over and over and over again until you get it, all right? <laughs> Everybody reach an arm up like this, or, or if you're particularly sore, you can reach both hands or alternate. That means you have something you want to share, and I think there will be a couple of roving mics around that, that we'll use. I want this to be very interactive, so I'm going to stop several times during the presentation and make you share stories or, or share examples as well. So. So that's, just, so that's not just me, but please wait for the microphone so we capture it on the, on the video for those, those watching the videos. The last part of this before I get started with my presentation is a psychology test. And I thought no better person could come give the psychology test than David Duffett because I learned this test from him. So David, come on up and... Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, as Jared said, it is high participation. So... Uh, if you believe in telekinesis, raise my arm. <laughs> Steve, I told you before about this sort of things. Anyway, carrying on. Uh, just before we go into this test, I must just tell you how important this test is, because if you don't know how important it is, it might be possible for you to watch it and not realise how important it is. But it's no stretch at all. It's not an exaggeration to say without this test, ComCon might never have happened. How, you ask? 2005... I was presenting in Dallas, Texas, first on, uh, no, second on, after a guy called Mark Spencer. As you know, uh, Mark's a very, very nice guy, and when the organizer's clicker for doing the PowerPoint stopped working, Mark Spencer says, I'll be your clicker. Even though we didn't know each other terribly well, he said, I'll be your clicker. So he sat at my laptop, and I nodded my head, and he hit it. And as I did this test, he really loved this test. I won't tell you what he came out as just yet. And afterwards, he said, I want you to be involved in Astricon. So I got to speak at Astricon in 2006 in the European tour. That's where I first met Jared and uh, Steve Sokol and all those people. And then six, five, blah, blah, blah. well, 2012, I go to a company in Kent to do some training. There's a young man called Dan Jenkins there who's written a very, very clever Node.js shim between his contact center software and Asterisk. And I said, you ought to really come to Astricon and talk about that. And... Then Dan came to Astricon and then got involved. So it really is true that were it not for this pair of slides, you might not be having ComCon. Anyway, let's get on with the test. 
OK, so all you have to do is a very simple test. You just, it's by way of an icebreaker, because we've been spending a bit of time together, and we know each other pretty well, but this will be the icing on the cake. This will give you a new dimension in knowing each other. So all you have to do is pick one of those shapes. And uh, if we just go to the next, has everybody picked a shape? Pick your Excellent. Shape. Okay, no changing shapes. Go with the top of the head response here. We don't want anybody over analysing this. Okay, so who are the triangles? Pop your hands up if you're a triangle. Keep your hands nice and high. Have a good look around at who the triangles are. Very important people. Go for it, Jared. Very important people. Directed and ambitious. It's the shape that says it all. You know, they know where they're going, and they've usually got a pretty good plan on how to get there. Those are the triangles. Sometimes they have sharp elbows. Sometimes, yes, sometimes they do. Okay, any um, squares in the room? Don't be afraid of being square. Hands right, nice. Have a good look, have a good look at the squares. These are, go, ahead, go for it, detailed conscious people. They're finishers. They like to colour up into the corners, all that kind of thing. You're, you're seeing there's some truth in this, aren't you, sir? Yes, I see. Yes, okay. All right, who are the circle people in the room? Again, keep your hands up. Let everybody else have a good look at you because the circle people, they're people people. Not only do they manage to be quite technical, but they manage to interact with other human beings. They're not the people in the really dark corner of the office that only speak hex and only come out on certain days. Indeed. Okay, what about the wiggly lines? How many wiggly... Now, keep, uh, now I, I, I anticipated this. Keep your hands up. Have a look in the round because... The, to go for it, Jared. Usually, it's an unhealthy obsession <laughs> with either Ed Sheeran... Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Go for the next one. Could be Meghan Markle. <laughs> or more, more usually in a gathering such as this, it's the open source communications. <laughs> and by the way, you'll be interested to hear that it was Mark Spencer who was a wiggly line. And he came up to me afterwards and said, I was a wiggly line. Anyway, with that, I'll hand back to Jared. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, David. So now that we've got the psychology test out of the way, I want to tell a little story. A little story about how I came to give this presentation. And that started uh, almost 21 years ago when I got married. I was a little skinnier, had a little more hair. And uh, my parents were very, very practical for my wedding. They decided to give me two wedding gifts, which I thought was a great idea until I found out that one of them was this little book that I'll talk about here in a minute. And the other was a day planner. And I don't know exactly what they were trying to tell me, but I think it's, they're trying to tell me I, I, I need some habits and I'm disorganized, something like that. I, I like to think of it, of it as I had my own habits. I didn't need anybody else's. And I wasn't disorganized as much as maybe I was alternatively organized. But we'll, we'll talk about that. So um, we'll talk briefly about the seven habits. It, it is a big number. I don't expect anybody to rattle, rattle them off, off, at, you know, off the top of their head at the end of the presentation. But... Um, and without going and giving away all the secrets in the book, um, the basic idea is there are seven habits that are built from principles, and those principles lead to the habits, and the habits lead to the outcomes that you want to have. And they're arranged in kind of a funny way. Um, they're arranged so that you start out at a, from, from dependence and move to a, an area of independence, which is helpful. But then the, the, the next three move you from independence to interdependence, which is apparently even more important, and we'll talk about that. Um, they're also organized so that the first three are about private victories, and that's how you get from dependence to independence. But then the next three are moving from independence to interdependence. These are about public victories. And then habit number seven is kind of an oddball, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so let's start, start off with habit number one. Habit number one is be proactive. In other words, don't be this guy. Right? How many know that? How many of you know a programmer that's like that? <laughs> Don't be afraid to raise your hands. We can raise our hands here, right? Which, is, which I find really, really funny because usually this same programmer is also the programmer that loves nothing more than to be right in the middle of a really hairy coding project and, oh, this is really cool. Oh, I found this new library. You know, the sort of thing. And I can't understand that dichotomy. But uh, the, the first habit that helps you get from being completely dependent on other people to, to, to a level of independence is is being proactive. Let's talk about this a little bit more uh, in, in terms of software. How many people wait until somebody comes to them and says, hey, there, there, this particular piece of the software is failing, maybe you ought to write a test for that? Or, hey, we need this new code, would you go write that? I mean, I've heard the adage that a lazy programmer is a good programmer, but there's, there, there's some balance here, right? So, so step, habit number one, step number one, uh, be proactive. Uh, the best way to do that is don't count the days, make the days count. 
which is an adage that I like. All right, let's move on to habit number two. And it's begin with the end in mind. Um, applying this to software, how do you know when your program's done? Is your software ever done? I'm <laughs> Where's, uh, where's Daniel? I, I know he was, uh, there he is. Hey, Daniel, when's Kamelio going to be done? <laughs> Matt Fredrickson, when's Asterisk going to be done? <laughs> hopefully, not for, hopefully not for a long time. Right? But how do you know? How do you know when a particular release is done? How do you know when version 1 is done and it's, start to, it's time to start thinking about all the features that you want in version 2? Yeah, you, you really need to decide in the beginning and, and set some goals and say, hey, when I get to this point, I'm going to call that good enough for now. I'm going to ship a release. And now I'll worry about anything that doesn't fit into that particular mold. We'll worry about that later. Or we'll make an exception or we'll come, come up with some sort of a process to think through it. Um, how do you start writing a program? Let's say I told you you had 15 minutes to write a program that, uh, I don't know, took in, t took in a SIP call, um, sent that over to a web browser via WebRTC and painted a, a, a picture on the, on the browser. How would you start out writing that? How many people would dump, jump right at the keyboard and start? How many people would jump straight to uh, Stack Overflow or, or Google? <laughs> How many people would, would pick up a, a piece of paper and a pencil and draw, draw, draw out a flowchart or draw out a, lo a logic diagram or a state machine or or something of that sort, to try to get the logic straight in your head before you sit down and code. That was one of the, the lessons I learned early in my career. I had a, a boss, he was absolutely fantastic, but he could crank out programs like you wouldn't believe. And I asked him what, one time what his secret was, and he says, a piece of paper and a pen. I was like, what? He says, no, I always sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, and I make myself sit there for 20 minutes before I ever touch the keyboard. And those 20 minutes are the most tw important 20 minutes of any programming project, because that's where I get things straight in my head, figure out how thing what's talking to, to what and how they're going to communicate, and, and then, then I can sit down and write the code. But if I try to write the code before I have all that figured out in my head, I code myself around in circles. So I think that's good. Uh, another way of putting this is uh, working hard without a purpose is like a Ferrari without a steering wheel. Now, with self-driving cars and, and, and that sort of thing, maybe, maybe we're a few, few years less you know, or closer to, to having Ferraris without steering wheels. But, uh, but I like this. This helps me remember, okay, you know, I've, got to, I've got to have a purpose um, for what I'm doing. So we already asked the question, how will, how will you know when, when your software is done? The one answer I didn't hear from anybody in the audience is, well, I've got tests for that. I've written my tests first, right? So I'm going to do a, just a little bit of a diatribe on test-driven development, right? You're going to find some people that uh, say, I don't need to debug my code. I use test-driven development. Is that ever true? It's really, really hard to do test-driven development 100% of the time and get it right all the time, right? Oftentimes, it's more like this. <laughs> and then you inevitably have this. I see a people, couple of people squirming in their chairs a little bit like, oh no, he caught me. <laughs> anyway, so, so think about what is the end goal you're trying to accomplish? What's a reasonable, some reasonable milestones along the way? And how do you work toward, towards those with a purpose? All right, on to habit number three. Putting the first things first. So when you sit down to, to write a program, what do you work on first? Do you work on the user interface? Do you work on the database abstraction layer? Do you work on the, on the logging or the debugging? Do you try to tackle a, a nice, easy step first? Do you try to do the, the, the hardest piece of the, the program first? Get that working first and then do the easy parts later. What's, what, what's most important? One of, the, one of the things that was most interesting for me in, in going through Stephen Covey's Seven Habits is that he, he splits, he, he builds these quadrants. He splits the, 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 the things that you need to do in a day into four different quadrants, and it's based on across the top whether it's urgent or not urgent, and down the side on whether it's important or not important, right? So here in quadrant number one, we have the things that are both urgent and important. These are things that just have to get done. This is putting out fires. This is your boss calls you on the phone and says, hey, Jared, I need you to drop everything and you know, those sorts of things. Those, those, those you just have to get done, right? 
in, in quadrant three here, I'm going to skip two for a second. In quadrant three here, we have things that are urgent but not important. And I, I personally find myself getting caught up in these, you know. An email comes and I've got a little notification on my taskbar and oh my goodness, I've got to go look at that email. It's urgent, but it's probably not that important, right? So these are things like interruptions, a lot of calls and meetings, you know, popular activities. I find that social media companies tend to really, really drive people towards quadrant three here because they're, they're in the business of saying, hey, you've just got a notification. You should look at it now because you're never going to find it an hour from now or two hours from now or tomorrow, right? So, so quadrant three, can, these, these are kind of our distractions. Um, quadrant two are the things that are not urgent, but they're important. And the, the, the point that Stephen Covey makes is you should really try to spend more time focusing on quadrant two. This is your relationship building. This is finding new opportunities. This is planning for the future. Um, one, of the, one of the analogies I like about this is anybody worked on a farm or, or been, been around a farm? I grew up on a farm in Wyoming in the United States. Um, this is mending the fences so that the cows don't get out. This is feeding the cows. Is one of those more important than the other? Can you just always worry about mending the fences and you know, helping the sick cows and, and, and that sort of thing? Or do you also have to just get in the habit of doing those things that are not urgent, but they're really, really important? You can't live very, very long on a farm if you don't, if you don't feed the animals. Think how much free time you'll have if you don't feed the cows, then it doesn't matter what happens with the fences. You also you starve pretty darn quickly. So. <laughs> Yep, and then in quadrant four, these are the things that are both not urgent and not important. So these are the time wasters, trivial paperwork, you know, half the comments on the internet, you know, you know arguing with trolls, those, those sorts of things. Now, I, I found this kind of useful, but what I found even more useful is putting it in something that tells me what to do with each of those quadrants. So I'll, I'll just throw this up here. Um, you know, quadrant one, we just kind of manage the, the crises and the pressing problems, but quadrant two is really about focusing on opportunities and planning and, and taking the bigger picture approach and, and relationship building. And that's one of the things I really like about this style of conference that Dan's put together, is this really does give us an opportunity to, to not just come and learn some technical things and, 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 and learn some new technologies, but it really does give us a chance to get the broader picture, open our eyes a little bit wider, and to get to know uh, other people in our industry. Um, with things in, in quadrant three here, these are the things to avoid. This is just the interruptions and the busy work. You can't completely avoid them, but you know, if you find you're spending 80% of your day in quadrant three, um, you're probably a great procrastinator like me, and you're using things in, in, in quadrant three, three as an excuse not to do the things in quadrant two. And then last but not least, you want to really limit the things in quadrant four. Those are the things that just aren't urgent or important. They're not, not, not worth your time. All right, almost halfway through here. Um, habit number four. This is about thinking win-win, meaning it's not a zero-sum game. There are oftentimes, whether it's in business or, or other places, you can have a win-win situation where you get what you want, but the other person on the other side walks away with a smile on their face as well, right? Now, in, in the software world, this is particularly the case because software development has never been a zero-sum game, right? If I go out and write a program and I sell it to David, right? That means I got some money, he, he got the program, but then if I sell that same program to Allison, did it cost me the same amount of development time to sell the copy to Allison as it did to, to David, right? No, so it's not a zero-sum game. So there are ways that we can, we can have a win-win, um, and this is particularly, um, you know, the, the case with open source software, you know, that, that a little bit of, of investment and development up front can benefit a whole lot of people down the road, and so, just look for those opportunities when you, where you can say, you know, I'm going to win, my client's going to win, the community's going to win, there's a win-win-win situation. Um, another important part of thinking win-win is just your basic attitude. And before the conference, I was having a really hard time coming up with what's the perfect slide to, to, to talk about the attitude and the way we treat people. Um, but then Mira put this picture on, uh, on Twitter yesterday from, from Dan's talk on the first day. I, I think that pretty much sums it up, <laughs> right? Um, the reason I put that up there is, is really to, to, to kind of drive home the point of this, this, next, this next slide, which is a tweet I received a few weeks ago, um, which really talks about, you know, software development is 20% of the problem and, or 20% of the project, and it's really 80% people. Anybody believe that? I see a few hands. Anybody not believe that? 
All right. Grab a, grab a microphone and tell me why, because I'm curious why you, why you think that software development is not 80% not people. Eric's bringing a microphone. I'm going to put you on the spot. Right, yeah, right. Alan first. OK, I, I would probably say it's 50-50 more than 20-80, my guess. Because obviously, the people are important. But obviously, if the code doesn't work, then why bother? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's use the mic, please, so we can catch it on video. I don't have an opinion right now because I don't know what the percentages are for time or skills or... or, e or. Either or. Yeah, if it was about soft skills, I would imagine, like, you could be a brilliant coder, but if you cannot collaborate with someone, that would be a pain. So, like, in that sense, you should be able to work effectively with other people, and 80% mm -hmm. would cover that aspect. But if it was time, I would assume that I would strongly disagree with it. But. How, how many people here like agile software development? What, what does that force developers to do? Collaborate, Collaborate communicate. Have another well, comment in the back here. One of the things I wanted to say is that we, I, I saw a t-shirt one time that was about a bug. And they essentially, it, it was, they paralleled it to like drug addiction. So it was like denial. And so personalities are very, closely interwoven to software development. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not just, it, it happens in all forms of software development. It's, it's the person that's coding on their own, and then I think it becomes even larger when you start working in teams. Yep. Yeah, especially, especially important in teams, and then even more important when it's op open source software development, right? Because you don't have any, necessarily any work relationship with the person submitting that bug request or, or submitting that pull request or that code, code patch. Um, and that's, that's when communication skills become even, even more important. There's another comment over here, whoever has the mic. Oh, there's. Oh, one over here. <laughs> Sorry, we're going to put uh, Eric through his paces here today. <laughs> My comment was just that I don't really understand the preposition at all because um, software is 100% code and code is 100% people, right? I, I, I don't kind of understand the distinction between the two things. Yeah. No, that's for, now, for now, software is 100% um, people. It's, it's, it's still people. With, with machine learning, maybe we're getting further and further away from that. I don't know. But yeah, it, it really depends on where you draw, draw the line there. But I would argue you can't build a, a, a large software project you know, on your own in an island without talking to other people, without, without those, the, those personal interactions with other people. And those skills are really, really important. I think it... I think it... How about you turn it's it off? High, but there's no Why don't you turn it off and just yell, and I'll, I'll repeat the question for the video. OK. It's 100% people. Because unless machines are doing all the coding, people are doing the coding. But the most important aspect, yes, it's getting along with other people. But the most neglected aspect, and that's why I'm shouting about it now, is test your fucking code before you put it out there. You have it tested by other people who aren't on the project because this is the most neglected aspect of getting quality code out there. It doesn't matter what tools you're using, and it doesn't matter how brilliant your people are. By the way, I just said the F-bomb. Hopefully you can edit I can, I can edit that. <laughs> uh, but you have to go for the ergonomics. You have to let people who are your target audience use it, mm -hmm. because not everybody thinks like engineers. This is the biggest sin of everybody, from big companies to small. Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat that for the video. Randy says um, it's 100% people because the code's written by people and that you should really make sure you test the functionality of your code. That's the other F, right? Functionality. Um, and, and, and that's the biggest sin we have sometimes as software developers is, is we test it from our perspective, from, from our vantage point, and we don't often do enough testing with people that are our, 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 our target audience or people that, who are not as familiar with the software as we are. Um, test, test, test is, is very, very important. I, I, I find that's very, very true. And that, uh, in, in some ways, that leads up to our next habit, which is habit number five. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. Um, anybody a Star Trek fan in the room? You, you'll, you'll understand this instantly. If you're not a Star Trek fan, you're probably shaking your head and saying, well, I don't, I, I, I don't get it. We got some Trekkies in the back. That's, that's great. Anybody know a developer like this? I'm sad to say I, I know a few as well. And uh, 
don't, don't be that guy. Please. <laughs> Please. Again, it goes back to, if you're this type of a developer, you're going to have a hard time taking input from others, communicating about the status of the project, um, you know, you know, getting, getting the right testing from the right you know, target audience, those sorts of things that, that, that we've talked about. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's probably enough said on that. Um, habit number six is a, is a word that I despise and loathe and have come to hate with a, with a perfect purple passion. Um, I don't like the word synergize. I think it's a stupid word. But I do like the concept behind it. And, uh, you know, think about uh, synergizing as, 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 again, we're moving from dependence to inter independence and then independence to interdependence. What does it mean to synergize? How do we, how do we work together with other teams in, in, in a beneficial way? Um, from a software perspective, I see this as... Um, a lot with libraries and frameworks and that sort of thing. If you're on the dependence end of the scale, you're writing everything yourself and you're dependent on a certain tool and a certain compiler and a, you know, the sort, a certain language to get things done, right? And as you move kind of to the middle, to independence, then you're able to write everything on your own and you know what you're doing and you could maybe use a different compiler or maybe you could use a different language, but you're going to write all the code yourself, right? Because you understand it and you know how to do it and I can do this, darn it. Right? Moving a little further to the other end of the scale with interdependence, that's when you say, hey, I'm going to write this piece, but I'm going to leverage this other library that's already been written out there. I don't have to write that piece myself. I can stand on the shoulders of somebody else who's already gone through that pain and it's been tested and it's been you know, worked out in the community. Same thing with frameworks, right? So again, this is where open source really, really shines. And it really helps because oftentimes in business, you're, you're, you're kind of given this false dichotomy. Are you going to build something or are you going to buy something, right? But I would say it's not just about build versus buy. I would argue that it's worth build versus buy versus leverage. And what I mean by leverage is take, take some libraries that are out there, either commercially available or open source, and build on top of those so that part of it's build, part, part of it's buy or acquire or download off of GitHub, and, and, and that will get you to the, to the end faster. Um, the other, the other uh, analogy I like to use with, with synergy, even though I don't like the word, is the idea of a light bulb. Let's say this is a, just, just off the top of my head, let's, let's argue for a second that that's a 75 watt light bulb. Okay? I want you to think back to ancient history, to, I don't know, late Bronze Age, and we're talking about the Babylonians. How many hours would, it, would a person in those times have to work to have the equivalent of one hour of light from a 75 watt light bulb? Any guesses? A year? So there, in 1996, there was a Yale economist named William D. Nordhaus who calculated it out. And, it, and he calculated out that at that time you would have had to work 41 hours to buy enough oil to light your lamp and have the equivalent of a 75-watt light bulb for an hour. That's a lot of work, right? How about, uh, let's, uh, since we've got some Americans and some Brits in the room, let's talk about the American Revolutionary War. I don't know, let's stir up a little controversy, right? How about, how about during those times? How, uh, you know, they were using candles mostly at that time. How, many, you know, how long would you have, have had to work to buy enough candles to be the equivalent of an hour's worth of light from a 75-watt light bulb? A little high. Pretty good guess. The answer is you have, would have had to work for five hours to buy the candles to, to light you know, the equivalent of a 75 watt light bulb for an hour. How about 1992? That's not that long ago, right? Some of us were still, still alive in, in, in 1992. Any guess? Less than 15 minutes. Like a minute. Yeah, a few seconds actually. And then the, those people who have solar panels on the roofs, you know, they're saying, it doesn't cost me anything, ha 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 ha. Right? But, why do I use this analogy? It's, it's to help you think about, you know, we've come a long way in terms of technology, but in certain terms of software development, it's the same, right? We're not all going out and, and writing our own SIP stack from scratch. We're not all, all building our own protocols from scratch. We're not all, all uh, going out and building our own version of a web browser so that we can talk to our own version of a web server, right? We're, we're standing on the shoulders of other people and, and the work that they've done. And, and that's where kind of the synergy really shines. And I'd be uh, negligent if I didn't also thank the, the people that helped make my presentation possible, the people that made this slide template available as, a, as an open source um, template under the Creative Commons license and some of the stock photographs that were open source, as well as the, you know, the, one of the backgrounds I used. 
So that's, that's the first six habits. The first three, like I said, from dependence to independence. The next three from independence to interdependence. The last one, uh, habit seven, is called sharpen the saw. This is about taking the time to catch your breath, take a broader look and kind of recycle through what you've done. Um, stop shoveling dirt for a minute, take a second to, to, you know, to, to, to sharpen, the, sharpen your shovel and, uh, and, and then get back to work. Um, it's about focusing on your craft, focusing on the tooling you're using. Um, now, you know, there's, a, there's a, a problem there if you're spending all your time working on your tooling and not actually getting anything done. I, I know people like that as well. But it's really about taking the time to step back, focus on how can I work smarter and not just harder, right? Um, I like to think, I, I, I like this quote. It says, getting comfortable is dangerous and staying comfortable is deadly. Um, you need to get uncomfortable every once in a while or else you're not going to continue to progress. Um, the, the, the quote that I found uh, a couple of years ago that I read to myself almost every day to keep myself motivated um, talks about going to the gym and working out. If you went to the gym and, and didn't sweat and didn't, you know, didn't, weren't sore, you weren't tired, you wouldn't, you, weren't, you wouldn't feel like you were getting anything out of the gym, right? The same, it's the same way with learning. You have to go out there and be confused about something. You have to stretch, you have to grow, you have to exercise to learn something. And so it, it wraps up by saying confusion is the sweat of learning. And I completely um, buy into this um, to the point where I've recognized in myself that if I'm getting comfortable, if I'm not confused about something, that means I'm not trying hard enough. I'm not, you know, I'm not going out and learning something new about SIP or learning something new about WebRTC or learning something new about you know, machine learning or wh whatever the case may be. If, if, if I'm not confused about it, then I'm not trying hard enough. So, uh, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, we're just about out of time, but you know, in traditional keynote fashion, I, I have to say, but wait, there's more, right? Um, after Stephen Covey wrote the, the, the Seven Habits, he, he wrote another book, which I have not read, called uh, The Eighth Habit, and it's about finding your voice and inspiring others to find theirs. Um, and I, I, I truly believe that uh, because I'm very passionate about open source communities and, and community building. I want to encourage everyone to take the knowledge they've learned, take, the, take, take the, the technologies they've learned, share those with other people. Find someone else you can share that with or mentor or help um, so that they can do those sorts of things as well. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I'm not that guy. I can't stand up and present. I can't teach other people how to do that. Um, it's imposter syndrome when we've all got a little bit of case of it and we all need to get over ourselves. Um, or as I like to say, I'm, I, I'm really not that good at having imposter syndrome, not like, like the other people who, who, who have it so much better than me. Um, this, was a, this was a tweet that I saw yesterday. Uh, the response was actually from a former coworker of mine. And the, the question is, how do you conquer your mental fears of inadequacy? And, and the short answer is you don't. You figure out where your boundaries are, you, you work hard, you do the best you can for yourself, you take care of yourself, but you're never just going to magically get over your, your, your fear of inadequacy. Another way of putting this is a, is a very scientific uh, pie chart here. I'll just let you read, read that on your own and, uh, and, and get a good chuckle out of that. So uh, to, to, to wrap up, I, I just want to say it's been interesting to me. I did not read that book when my parents gave it to me 21 years ago. It took me about 19 years before I took it off the shelf and dusted it off and said, you know, maybe there's something in here for me. It certainly helped me over the past couple of years as I've tried to apply those, those principles and those habits that I've learned in the book. I'm not perfect yet. I'm, I'm still working on a lot of things, but, uh, but I feel like I'm headed in the right direction and, and doing the right things. And I uh, want to thank you for, for giving me a little bit of your time. And if in, any of this resonated with you, again, please take, take what you've learned and go share it with someone else. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Any questions? Martin, thank you. Any questions for the ghost of Stephen Covley? Questions, stories, observations, funny jokes. Okay. Um, any thoughts on how any of this stuff ties in with some of the more modern thinking about motivation like progress principle, um, which is this principle around uh, uh, small incremental gains are, are some of the most motivating things we do as human beings and kind of structuring our, our, our kind of activity around that? Sure. Um, I have lots of thoughts on, on, on the subject. I don't know that I've got it, you know, 
well enough sorted in my head to, to, to be really articulate about it. But I've found that different things motivate different people for different reasons. And sometimes the things that you think are motivating to someone, like, hey, I'll give you an extra $5,000 this year in your salary if you do these extra things, can actually be demotivating rather, rather than motivating. Because when you put a dollar value on it, then you're doing it just for the money and not for the, the intrinsic uh, motivation. Um, I do like to see smaller things rather than larger things be put on the table. I, I think that goal setting is very important. I think it's very often done incorrectly and for the wrong reasons and with the wrong, with the wrong motivations behind it. Um, if, if you want to read a really interesting book, and I'm sure some of you have already read it, uh, a guy by the name of Daniel Pink has a, a book called Drive, which absolutely changed the way I, th I thought about, both the way I motivated myself and how to motivate those who, who report to me at work. Um, but there's, 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 there's still a lot to be learned in that, in that particular area. And, and everybody's wired a little bit differently too, so it's, it's hard to apply a general pattern to, to the entire population. The one thing... The one thing I, hello? okay, now it's working. He, he, he cut me off, okay. The, the one thing I would add to all of this is never give up the opportunity to learn from somebody because you'd be surprised at how much you can learn from somebody that you think knows nothing. My three-year-old grandson teaches me an awful lot. Yep, absolutely. The, the, the adage that I like says, hey, if you're going to burn, the, burn bridges, at least keep the blueprints, you know. Even if you decide, hey, I'm not using that technology, I'm using this technology instead, try to learn the lessons that that other, you know, that, that, that other technology solved. Otherwise, you're going to run into those same problems as well. I think there's one more question. Mira. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I'm really happy to see a full house about these topics. Um, there's a thing, I just wanted to add uh, something a little there. There's a thing that if you never want to hear from somebody, you should give them money. It, it does <laughs> apply. <laughs> It really does. To what you're saying. That's and yes, I have noticed through the 13 years, uh, nearly 14 now, that I have been working at Zoiper and managing people, that indeed money is not, it's really not the motivation. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter on what level they are. Um, salespeople are, are relatively motivated by commissions, but that's about it. But it, the commission there is actually not so much for the money, it's the the number is kind of giving them the, the thrill of it. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, 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 that's absolutely true. Um, I found that early in people's careers, they tend to focus on, oh, I need this much salary, I need, to get a, I need to get a bonus, I need to get you know, up to this level. There's, there comes a certain point in most people's careers where it's less about the salary and it's about the quality of life and the type of work they're doing. That it's about you know, the old adage that says, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And, and I think a lot of people like to get to that point. And then it's less about, okay, exactly how many dollars or how many pounds sterling am I, am I getting in my paycheck every month? And, and it's more about, am I having fun? Am I doing something that's challenging? Am I doing something that, that makes me feel good when I, you know, when, I, when I come home at the end of the day? Maslow is, Maslow is a whole different set of <laughs> discussions. I think there's one, one more, and then we're, we're, we're out of time. Okay. You'll be last. Thanks. So uh, I'm not a software engineer. I'm not a developer. I'm probably the only salesman here. So uh, can I finish on a joke? Okay, so uh, how many software engineers it takes to change a light bulb? None, it's a hardware problem. <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to end, thank you. Okay. From here we go into the workshop.